Hey, Bob WP here, and welcome to the final emerging tech for 2023. Hey, do the Woo podcast show. This show is brought to you by Jetpack and all the innovations they are bringing with AI at jetpack.com forward slash AI. I'll tell you more about them later in the show, but it's time for host Kathy and Dave to reflect a bit on the year in emerging tech and touch on what's to come. So let's get right into it. And here we are. It's the last episode of the Emerging Tech Do the Woo podcast, and it's just us, Dave, just you and me. I know you. Like like the officers in December, nobody's nobody's coming in. Yeah, no, nobody's here. Everybody's on vacation. It's December. All of these people with their unlimited PTO just off having a great time with friends and family. But but we're here. We're holding down the fort. <laughs> so how has twenty twenty three been for you? Have you had a good year? I've had a a good year. Yeah, it's been it's been a wild year, hasn't it? Like the first full year of GPT, um, you know, I think this time last year it had only just really come out uh, and it was just getting on people's radar uh, and it just feels like it's totally exploded this year. Taken a lot of oxygen out the room, even though there are other things happening with other shiny technologies, it's all been about the AI and uh, I don't know, it's this weird balance between everyone's just like suddenly totally used to it uh, and then every day still getting your mind blown by it. Have you, have you found that? It's um, it's become part of my just workflow. When I, I mean, when it first came out, I was like, there's no computer who can write better than me. And I still kind of think that, like, I still improve upon it, but I use it as a research tool all the time. Now, a year later, instead of I'm never going to use that AI to write my words, I've gotten to the point where it's like, all right, tell me what you got and let me make it better. And so it's become a part of my research workflow. So I don't like say, oh, write me this white paper about WordPress security, but I'm like, all right, tell me what you got. And then I improve upon it. So it is definitely a part of my workflow. And I've learned a lot of like little prompt cheat code type of things that have made my life easier. And I've really had a lot of fun watching sort of the info security or the infosec space, try to hack it, try to get it to like give the dirt on vulnerabilities and things like that. And of course, somebody gatekeeps that and shuts that down pretty quickly. But it's it's been a fun tool to just watch, I think, how people have used it. Over the past year, it's been very interesting for me. I think uh, I think I saw a tweet earlier that um, said that Google had managed to use one word to hack open AI. I didn't, didn't read the on the headline, but yeah, it's been an interesting arms race in terms of what can they lock out versus how how can people be creative and get around that. But, I think that's all part of the same spectrum of like us learning to use the tool. I think that's just the other side of the coin of um, learning to abuse the tool. I think for me, it's just been something that I've used in more and more ways, um, and hopefully better as well. But uh, I started off using it for like research, and then I was doing some coding stuff with it because I can write that code myself, but it, it sure could. Um, and I actually found myself using it as like a personal coach and counselor halfway through the year, um, doing some like self-discovery stuff, uh, building upon some of the coaching that, that we have available to us at Automatic and some of the work I've done personally. So that's been really interesting too. And I've had a lot of fun with mid-journey as well, just um, playing around and I guess pretending to be the artist that I'm not naturally. That's fun. I haven't tried Mid Journey at all. I should. I've seen some interesting things that people have done with it. It, um, yeah, d just different levels of creativity. One thing I did try is it's a headshot generator. It's an AI generator. You you load up about twenty pictures, ten to twenty pictures of yourself, and then it spits back all of these other pictures of you, like 
fancy. Like I'm at the Oscars and I'm wearing all of the sequined gowns and big fluffy poofy things that I would never be caught dead in. And that was kind of interesting because I never saw myself that way. Like I never saw myself dressed like I would have been much more, you know, professional and not looking like, you know, Jane, who's trying to sell a split level in (laughs) Naperville, you know, that kind of thing. So it changed like how I thought about myself. Um, So it was kind of an interesting tool. And now I've used some of those, those AI generated headshots. Like I've I feel like they're kind of me-ish. They're close enough. Like if I did go do my hair, if I did go buy the fancy jacket, whatever, like, yeah, I could look like that. That could be me. I'm, I have no problem like putting that out there as me. Whereas when I first did it, I would never have. So I, I think like those types of things that AI could say, have you ever thought about this? Like things that you've never thought of or things that you would never position your product as being in a certain way or position your brand in a certain way. I think for marketers, it's been really an interesting tool to, and there's so many different different tools out there that have really helped like marketers. Like um, Bob was telling us about one that he was using for YouTube. And I've used one like doing videos, taking long form videos. And it's like, all right, find me the, the short form. Find me a one minute clip in this. I don't want to listen to the whole thing there's an AI tool that does that, that, that tells you like, here are the top 10 clips as AI sees it. Shortcut there. Don't have to listen to the whole thing. So I've been using like, there's, the thing is, is like, I think ChatGPT like took off and it really became forefront in people's minds. And then all of these other really innovative people who are probably laid off from big companies in the past year, because there's been a lot of layoffs and they're like, okay, let's try our hand at this AI thing. So there have been a number of businesses that have cropped up that are doing unique things like building on like the API with OpenAI. Um, it has just been so interesting. Have you seen anything like that? I have used a bunch of that stuff too. Um, one of those studio headshot tools uh, turned me into a glamorous woman, which was quite, uh, which is quite amusing. Uh, but I've done that. Um, like at work camp Lisbon, I did some videos where it like did a um, animated version of me, and I sort of trained a voice model so it could read out a script and stuff. Um, so yeah, that that's been really interesting, and it has been. I don't know. I I think there are some really smart people building some really smart stuff with it, but it's also really difficult to see what is going to be defensible longer term. Um, you know, there, there's been a lot of VC money thrown at things that are essentially just a wrapper for OpenAI. And uh, I think the multimodal stuff, this, like kind of the last few months has been released. As we see more and more of that, I think it's going to be, I don't know, they've just got so much gravity now. Uh, if they can avoid like self imploding their organization, um, then uh, that, yeah, it's pretty scary. Um, exhilarating, but also terrifying. You can just sort of feel that, feel the gravity of having that model um, and that training data. So, yeah, I've really enjoyed playing with that, that stuff this year, but. Um, you know, as, as ever, Kathy, I feel slightly frustrated not to have thought of like a killer startup uh, that has retired me into comfy billionaireship um, over the last year. Yeah, I don't know. Crypto's kind of taken off again. It's here we are at the end of 2023 going into 24. And I think there's like another Bitcoin having that could be like that could be your catapult into billionaire status. Yeah, maybe. Um, but yeah, crypto has become, after a year of very like dry price action and minimal interest with all of the AI stuff that's going on, the last quarter has been a lot more interesting in crypto land. Um, I mean, I've been staying, I guess, closely involved with a lot of things over this whole year. Um, and I can, um, I can kind of see what I think are a few trends coming out um, that are relevant to WordPress. One is, 
tokenized content. So yes, NFTs, but um, not just for pictures, also for articles and for social things like Mirror and Paragraph um, are both publishing tools that are on chain. Uh, and then you've got some visual ones as well, base paint. A lot of it's about um, collaboration. So letting multiple people contribute to um, a piece and then get rewarded for that. Uh, and a lot of it is about just being able to collect things as well. Uh, so this idea that instead of putting a paywall up and stopping people from accessing your content in the first place, if it's something that they value and they want to keep a hold of, actually collecting is a better experience than bookmarking. So yeah, I've been watching that carefully because I think after that, you know, you can you can sort of see the opportunity for WordPress there. You know, we people create posts if those can become tokenized and collecting those posts is a better experience than bookmarking them, then that feels like a win all round. Um, but what I think as well is that you end up getting a bunch of social effects with it because of this under, underlying crypto network. You know, once you have somebody that's created a, to, a tokenized content and somebody else has collected it, actually that's now a, a connection between the creator and the consumer that is on chain. It's not just somebody in a MailChimp list that you could lose access to. It's, you know, it's a wallet to wallet uh, relationship. And people have built a whole bunch of tools that let you interact wallet to wallet. So whether it's a push notification, whether it's a, an email, whether it's instant messaging and chat, like you can do all of those things across um, cryptographic addresses. So I think that's my hope is that when you back a lot of Web2 experiences into um, allowing people to connect with the wallet, I guess once you back Web2 into Web3, then suddenly it opens up what you can do with um, open identity and open content and things like that. Like it's, a, it's a real opportunity for the open web, I think, to come back fighting against the uh, walled gardens of Meta and um, TikTok. Yes, definitely. Oh, that's so interesting. I haven't been following that at all, but it sounds like, sounds refreshing and back to sort of like the fundamentals of what the internet's all about. And that is connecting people <laughs> and connecting people without having, um, you know, these behemoth organizations controlling what you see, who you connect to the news that you hear, um, and having it be much more a one-to-one -one or a one-to-many kind of relationship that's unfiltered and then selected by that end user. That just sounds sounds refreshing and amazing because I talk to so many people where they're like, okay, well, I'm going to do this on Facebook or I'm going to do this on X, Twitter. I'm going to do this thing on Instagram. And I'm just like, where's your website? <laughs> get your website straightened out first, have a platform, have a, a hub where you can at least like control all of the conversations in case algorithms change. And nobody thinks about that because it's just like, oh, well, there's Facebook. We all know that AI is constantly growing and it's going to continue to be a part of all of our businesses. Jetpack has been launching new AI tools monthly, giving you and your clients the power to create revise and optimize content without leaving the WordPress editor. Jetpack AI Assistant simplifies the creation and the customization of sleek forms, tables, and lists for your pages and posts, making routine tasks more efficient. Plus, you can give feedback on drafts. And lastly, for any content you do create, you can adapt the tone of the content. It can be formal, it can be humorous or anything in between. So if you want to learn more about this, whether for yourself or for your clients or both, just head over to jetpack.com forward slash AI to get the latest tools. And I think in a lot of cases, there's a lot of younger, the younger generation, they just, they know apps and they don't understand like the basics of, 
And why would they? What what need is there for them to understand the basics of TCP IP and how the internet works? That uh, unless they're my children and I use that as a torture device for them. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I definitely think there's a large, significant danger that a large proportion of the WordPress community are uh, stuck in the past. But I think more importantly, it creates content and it gives people the freedom to create that content. But it's it's definitely not perfect, right? Like you kind of go coming back to this idea of bookmarks, you know, you can rent a domain and you can rent some hosting and you can publish an article that people really love and people can bookmark it. But you can also lose your domain and you can lose your web hosting and suddenly, you know, what's living at that URL is not the same thing, you know, or it's not there at all. One of the kind of crossovers between these two technologies, AI and crypto, is I think that people will need to prove that they have created some content you know, they're going to want to be able to say, like, this is definitely mine. Like, I want, you know, I want a share of the proceeds or, you know, this is how I'm monetizing and these are the rights attached to this content. I think the the days of just, like, freely creating content and just, like, putting it out there without a care in the world are kind of over. So if you're going to, I guess, like, sign or attest to a piece of content with your identity, then it matters that that is your content, your identity. So I think across a sort of short and even medium term timeline, it doesn't really matter if that identity is provided by TikTok or YouTube or or whoever else. But as we move from this world where we're like, oh, well, people kind of make it, you know, make some money online to a lot of the world depends on being online to make their living, then I think you start seeing the concept of identity needing to transcend, you know, am I logged into my TikTok account, my Instagram account, or my Google account? Because you're the same person, you're just creating across these different channels. Like, that's one part of it. Uh, And it's kind of distinctly not something that those tech giants are going to do is to say, oh, there you can log into TikTok with your Instagram account, right? There's going to be, you know, they're kind of naturally protective. Um, So if you want to have an identity that you can take to those other platforms uh, and indeed take away from those other platforms, then it's kind of prior to it, right? It has to be something that's part of the open web. It has to be more fundamental than that. And that, for me, is what uh, crypto does, is it gives you an identity which is prior to whatever accounts you have anywhere else. And, of course, you get for free with that the ability to, like, prove that you posted some content on chain because you can either post the content itself, you can post a signature, you can notarize it, you can do whatever you want. So I think that's one of the interesting kind of intersections of these two things is like AI threatens content creators so it becomes more important that their identity is tied to their content and if they want to if their content is monetized and they want to benefit from that monetization over a longer time frame then they probably can't just leave their identity in the hands of like whichever TikTok giant is like the flavor of the day like it has to be something prior to that. So that's something that I'm really interested in as a sort of back to the open web thing. But in terms of how that relates to WordPress, then I think you can say just because you're creating content using WordPress, it doesn't mean that you are creating a WordPress-powered website. You can create content that can just go into a tokenized format and like go into the Right, you can it can live anywhere. I think we've conflated multiple 
ideas into content management system. You know, there's content creation, there's content curation, there's content publishing, there's content storage. And those are all actually things that can be unbundled. So one possible feature, I think, for WordPress is that you can, it will allow you to create content in whatever way that you want um, with whatever identity that you want and publish it in any way that you want as well. And then I think we've got a chance to go beyond this sort of dinosaur idea of a website into a world where actually what matters to people is content and the ability to consume it in um, whatever way it suits them and according to whichever algorithm best suits them at the time. Sure. Yeah, because that's what it ultimately, I mean, all of the technologies that we've had with the web, from from servers to the HTML we put on those servers, and, you know, just down to the base fundamentals, it's just people connecting with people. It's people sharing their thoughts, their ideas, their, it's the marketplace of ideas at its fundamental so, you know, content management systems are really just like the easiest on ramp to that so that people aren't like hand coding HTML and notepad anymore, that type of thing. But that's all there really are is like the easiest on ramp into that system. But there's so much, there's so much going on with a WordPress website. There's so much going on with a website, just like servers that have to be maintained and, and all of that. And then making something so much more simple that it just gets back down to people connecting to people with their content and building upon that marketplace of ideas that can be just so fundamental. Be interesting where blockchain takes all of that. Um, there's also, I want to ask you a question about like, a lot of like the early days of the internet, there was there was a ton of like anonymous content or like think about like how Reddit works. Like you've got, yeah, users and you can go back and look at all of these users, but you don't necessarily know who, you know, Max123, <laughs> you know, they, all of these like usernames. They just don't necessarily, they, they can become branded, you know, they can become an identity, but you don't necessarily know who's be behind all of that. And uh, I think a lot of really interesting things have happened in sort of anonymous forums where you don't necessarily know who the person is behind something, but an innovative idea can or or just like a challenge to the system type of thing can happen in an anonymous way um, where it's less about the person saying it, you know, like a certain politician may say something and everybody hates that politician. So therefore what they're saying gets tarnished by that reputation. Whereas if they say it completely and totally anonymously, it can have a different kind of weight and a different kind of meaning. It can be taken in a different way and vice versa. Where would anonymity, the power of anonymous uh, content generation fit in with blockchain? Yeah, I was uh, actually just trying to find a quote, uh, but I can't find it. I don't want to hold up the conversation. It's, it came out of this course I did called Kernel, K-E-R-L-E-L dot -E -E community. And it's some, uh, I'm going to butcher it a little bit. So sorry, Andy, if you're listening. It's something like, uh, the best way to, um, protect free speech is to price it correctly. Um, because if you, let me think about this. So we've seen the challenges that arise if you have, like anonymous access to anything online, you know, you get people doing bad things of uh, one flavor or another with them. Um, and so the way that we're trying to defend against that generally at the moment is through having a firm grip of people's identity. So that might be just sort of verifying that this email account belongs to you, or it might be, you know, you have to upload your full government ID. And that's definitely one approach, but um, there's also an economic approach, which is, you know, you can say and do what you want, but there's a cost associated with doing that. And um, that can either be like an explicit cost that you pay up front, like it costs a lot of money to uh, upload a 
big bit of data to their Ethereum blockchain because it has to be stored by thousands of computers around the world. Um, or it can be in the form of staking. So you can uh, have a reputation uh, online and you can publish some content. But if it turns out that you have been in breach of the rules, whatever those rules are, then your stake could be slashed. People can take that money from you. And I think those are more elegant ways of trying to solve the problem than forcing everyone to have uh, an overt identity online because that itself also has challenges around oppression and around, particularly around all the kind of big data and um, advertising stuff that, you know, I guess the last few years have made pretty clear isn't taking the world in a great direction. I will say it is good to know that there are so many brilliant minds working on the problems of the internet and trying to solve some of these things and trying to get back to some of the ideals that we had when the internet came together, when the internet started. So that's that's super exciting. That'll I'm sure we'll start to see some additional things coming forward in, in 2024. Big plans for Christmas this year? Uh, big plans for doing very little. I intend to uh, eat some turkey. We might go on a little uh, RV excursion. Um, but on that, no, just a bit of time out, some family time. How about you? Dealing with the, the pets, the dog that's currently barking, and just hanging out with the family. So that's that's about it. C- kicking the dog and surviving the family. Well, on that note, let's just wrap it up and we'll give... Uh, Bob, some fun editing time. Um, and we'll see you next time. Happy Christmas, Bob. <laughs> happy Christmas, Bob. This is our gift to you, our dogs. <laughs> well, happy happy holiday season. Yes. And thanks for listening. See you, Kathy. Well, thanks, Dave and Kathy, for keeping us on top of things throughout the year and looking forward to the show in 2024. And do visit jetpack.com forward slash AI to learn about all their AI tools as well. And as you can guess from the end of the show, we had a variety of furry visitors and other fun stuff happening in the episode that I, well, edited out. But to be honest, those furry friends are part of our family. And yes, as you experienced, they do have the last word. I think we have about three or four more episodes before we end 2023, including our own wrap-up coming soon. So until the next time, 